Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. So I think this talk might be a nice extension uh, of the previous one uh, because we are also uh, working with medical imaging. So uh, my name is Andreas Kopp. I'm part of the Microsoft team um, from the uh, customer success unit to deliver all kinds of AI engagements to our customers, um, including cognitive services and also Azure machine learning. Uh, we worked in particular, Hamke and I worked a lot of uh, use cases when it comes to medical imaging, including this one here about federated learning. Um, but before I move on to the introduction of the session, Hamke, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Harmke Alkemade. I'm based in Amsterdam uh, and I'm part of the same team as Andreas, so part of the, the worldwide customer success unit at Microsoft. Thank you. All right. So yeah, then let's get started with federated learning based on Azure machine learning. Um, maybe set things in context a little bit as mentioned so Harmke and I started working on medical imaging uh, one and a half years ago and the idea was similar to what we've just seen in the previous session to show what's possible uh, when it comes to Azure machine learning and the idea was to address various medical use cases so you see things like brain tumor detection, you see things like blood cell detection or even large scale cell segmentation. Uh, but we also wanted to address various use cases in terms of the of the audience, so the, the users. So maybe you have somebody in a hospital who is a, let's say, full time data scientist, really an expert, and we want to demonstrate if you do, for example, custom PyTorch development, uh, what the benefits are if you are moving from your local machine to an Azure machine learning workspace to be able to uh, work together with your um, team peers to manage um, assets or so manage data sets, train models, leverage the Azure machine learning compute, manage all your experiments and the resulting assets. We also have an item which is focusing on, let's say, medical ML ops. So once you have your initial pipeline developed, now you want to automate things. For example, there is coming more data in um, during production and you want to automate the retraining of models. Uh, and here we switch gears a little bit. Let's say I'm not a professional data scientist. I'm a physician, so I have some understanding about um, machine learning, but I'm not a data scientist. And I want to use, as we have seen in the previous session, AutoML for images, for blood cell detection, for example, or even for large scale cell segmentation. So um, very interesting for somebody who is uh, more a domain expert, not necessarily a data scientist. And then um, obviously as it's important for our medical setting for everything what we do in healthcare is data privacy, patient's privacy. So we have two capabilities for doing machine learning and preserving patient privacy at the same time. One is leveraging um, differential privacy to ensure that the data, there's no way to leak any data out of the trained model. And the last piece is the key topic of today's session. This is about federated learning so that a couple of institutions can build a joint machine learning model without the need to share any data. The example that we are going to show is also based on a medical imaging example, but federated learning is not only relevant for healthcare. It's also applied in uh, FSI, for example, in the public sector. So keep in mind, even though this is, example is uh, about healthcare, federated learning is relevant beyond that. So and really to understand what federated learning is and what its benefits are, let's look at how we are doing machine learning 
at the moment. So what's the state of the art? The state of the art is central machine learning. So there is one institution like this Mo Memorial Hospital, for example. So they have collected patient data from their local CT scanners, for example, and they want to train a machine learning model. The problem is, as we all know, in particular for deep learning, the more data and the more uh, variety you have in your data, the better is the model. This is in particular true for um, aspects like age, gender, ethnical background, but also medical preconditions, for example. So it might be the case, uh, even though they might have a lot of data, for a particular rare disease or for a particular cohort, it's simply not enough. So they are able to train the model, but the performance is like here. It's not really good. It's okay, so it's better than random, but it's not very good. Um, of course, the Memorial Hospital is not the only hospital in the world uh, which has data and which has similar questions they want to solve, right? So there are other hospitals, they have similar, but of course, observations from different patients, and they would benefit from the same thing. Um, and their local results would be probably very similar. So if you see this example, um, the obvious um, way to do, to continue, would be just to say, oh, let's pool everything, let's put all the data together, the patient data, let's train a joint model, right? So um, this is typically done in, in other um, industries, for example, where privacy is not, uh, not an issue. So if they would pool everything together, if they would combine their data, the result of the machine learning model would probably be much better, in particular for more rare diseases. But as you can imagine, this um, typically does not happen because of uh, compliance concerns. So there are legislations like uh, GDPR, HIPAA, for example. Um, so their patient data is extremely well protected by those regulations for good reasons, obviously. And even beyond that, there are a lot of concerns um, like, uh, can we do that? Uh, what about do we need patient uh, approval to do this, to uh, consent, to share the data, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why there are many use cases where organizations would benefit from sharing data, but it does not happen, not in healthcare and also not in many FSI use cases um, because they are, they are really concerns about sharing data. And this is where federated learning comes into the game. So the idea of federated learning is simply multiple parties train collaboratively without the need for sharing any data. And the way it works is on a high level, we have, uh, let's say a central institution coordinating the federation. So there is a notion of a federated server, which um, has a global model this global model is distributed to all of the participants, so to the clients or to the sites. There are several, uh, several uh, words for that. Each of those institutions then uses own private data to train the model, the local copy of the model. After the training is completed, the weights the parameters or so to say the the insights what the model has learned from the local data is then um, transferred back to the federated server there the data is aggregated a new version of the model is built and then this new model is distributed again to the clients and then the next training cycle or the next training round begins so we have one model which is shared but the data never leaves the client's premises. So it stays local, it is not shared. It's the only thing which is shared are the insights that were derived from the training from the data. That's the key idea of federated learning. Maybe to look a little bit more 
technically how that works. It's typically four steps. So step number one is, um, as I already mentioned, uh, it's called model broadcast, which means that the server instructs the clients, here we have three hospitals in this case, to download the latest version of the model, which means every client in the previous slide, it was indicated as local model, but it's actually, it's a copy of the latest version of the global model. So here now we are just looking what's happening in the green hospital, but the same thing happens in the other hospitals. So uh, the green hospital uses their own local data points to train the model based on uh, classic uh, stochastic gradient descent in deep learning, for example. So kind of fine tuning based on the latest version of the global model, then uh, we the, the the learned weights, the updated weights are then provided back to the server, to the central location as a small focused update. That's the only thing which is communicated back to the central institution, which orchestrates the whole federation. On the central level, um, the server does not only get the results from the green hospital, it also gets the result from the yellow and the red hospital. Then those weights are aggregated. Um, so there are several um, algorithms, federated algorithms to aggregate those um, results back. And then there is one aggregate model update, uh, update which is then applied to the model, to the global model, which means we have a new iteration of the a new version of the global model, which is then sent back to all of the hospitals. And then the next training round begins. Um, this process is either continued until uh, we are satisfied with the results, um, or you can also use it in a kind of continuous learning because during production, of course, we can anticipate new data points are generated in the hospitals. So you can also use it in a continuous learning fashion, uh, but that's of course a decision um, of the experiment design, whether we want to do continuous learning or just maybe finish after 200, 300 rounds. That's not untypical for federated learning. And then we have a resulting model for the benefit of all participants. A um, couple of uh, options and considerations. So the initial federated learning was actually invented by Google, um, not in this enterprise scenario, but in a um, more consumer-oriented consumer uh, scenario, uh, which is called cross-device. So for smart uh, keyboard scenarios, so for next word prediction, federated learning was and is still used um, on uh, consumer smartphone devices or smartphone devices in general. We are talking more um, about uh, what's called a cross-silo scenario, so an enterprise scenario where the participant participant is not as an individual but an organization like those hospitals and it's typical in the area of not millions of uh, participants like in the cross device scenario so it's maybe tens or hundreds of uh, institutions they have their own IT infrastructure there are no bandwidth considerations so the setup is quite different compared to this mass cross device scenario in terms of to, uh, topologies, what you've seen in the previous slide is based on an aggregation server. So kind of a hub and spoke um, architecture, but there are also serverless um, architectures like a peer-to-peer -to -peer topology is also possible, but it's not as common as this uh, architecture with a, with a central server. And when it comes to parameter aggregation, there are uh, several options. The most basic one is called federated aggregation, which simply means we build an average based on all the what is sent back by the participants. We weight those um, parameters 
by the number of observations. So for example, if one hospital uh, contributes 50% of all data points of all patient images, for example, then its weight would be 50% overall. That, that's uh, weighted averaged um, uh, aggregation. There are um, extensions of that. So based on cryptographic protocols, you could also do secure aggregation, which means that um, the server is not able to reason over individual weights. It can all, all only uh, make sense of them in, in aggregate just to avoid any man in the middle attacks, for example, or that the server would be able to uh, reason uh, about um, single hospitals weights. So this is secure aggregation based on cryptographic protocol. Um, there is also robust aggregation. Whenever there's a new technology, of course, you can think of new ways to, um, to attack it. So there is an attack which is called model poisoning that somebody tries to break the model by sending huge, large um, parameter updates, which could um, ultimately um, poison the whole model. So there is also robust aggregation, which takes care of those, let's say, extreme values, which could, which could also be outliers. So a couple of um, different ways to do parameter aggregation. I think the, the benefits of this technology are obvious. So it addresses privacy and intellectual property um, challenges, which means it also motivates more institutions to participate, which in turn can lead to more and more diverse data, which then helps uh, to support new use cases like rare disease research, high precision medicine, and these kind of things. On the other hand, of course, there are also limitations. So while it is a privacy preserving technology, it does not protect against all classes of attacks. So um, sometimes in deep learning, uh, you have the problem that it's possible to reconstruct individual data points of those new modern large models because they tend to memorize um, data points, even though there is no heavy overfitting, it still happens. Uh, so it's possible to do model inversioning and there, there are examples where it was possible to reconstruct uh, recognizable images of people, for example, uh, and federated learning does not protect against this. So what you can do is you can combine federated learning with differential privacy to prevent these kind of attacks. Um, but there are also other considerations. For example, by definition, right, we do not share any data, which means also doing something like EDA is more difficult because there is no common data set, right? The, data sets are not shared by definition. And also um, everybody in particular, when it comes to object detection or segmentation, we have to agree on data annotation policies and everybody has to follow these rules because if hospital A uh, does com data annotation completely different than hospital B, this will obviously be a challenge for also for the federated learning exercise. And um, what we would like to show you in the second part of the session is to see it in action. So in particular, Harmke has developed a nice demo of doing federated learning based on a combination of Azure machine learning. So you can think of Azure machine learning as providing the whole infrastructure, the whole compute, but also the whole data science management part. So to manage the metrics, the experiments, et cetera, and also to register the resulting model. And for the federated learning part itself, we are using NVIDIA Flare, which is one of the most popular libraries for federated learning. So NVIDIA Flare is executing the uh, federated learning workflow itself. It provides the algorithms for federated learning. It supports frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch. So you are quite flexible in your preferred data science um, or deep learning um, framework. And it also, if you want to, you can add things like 
uh, homomorphic encryption or also differential privacy to increase the level of protection even further. And one nice benefit of NVIDIA Flare is also you can start in a kind of simulated environment. So based on one local machine or on one VM, which simulates several participants and also the server before you go into the wild and actually deploy all those um, capabilities to a real distributed setup, which is of course um, uh, complicated and maybe in the first step you just want to play with the federated training itself. And with that, I would like to hand over to Harmke to show federated learning in action. Thanks, Andreas. Let me share my screen. Um, and happy to hear when, uh, when this is live uh, for everyone to see. Are you sharing the slide or something? Yes, else? I'm sharing the slide. At the yes, moment. I yeah. can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, after this uh, yeah extensive introduction of federated learning and our approach, let's shift gears to the demo. And for that, I quickly want to bring up this slide again, just to give an overview of what you will see during this demo to hopefully make it a bit more clear because it's quite a technical setup. So what we will deploy for this demo is first a federated server. So this is the, uh, the central compute that we will use both to send out the instructions for the different hospitals. So uh, what are the training instructions that they should use for training their model? Uh, and this is also the place where these models are aggregated. And this federated server will be deployed in a data science virtual machine on Azure. Other than the server, we have three different clients. So these are the three different uh, hospitals that we work with in the setup. We have a hospital located in the US, uh, a hospital located in Europe and a hospital located in Asia. And for all these hospitals, we will deploy a machine learning workspace where the compute will happen for training the local model. And we also have a local version of the data set in each of the hospitals. So I will also show you how to split your data sets uh, because well, most data sets that you can find online for, for demo and training purposes are just a central data set. But we will actually split this data set into three different parts to make sure that we have uh, local data sets to work with for these hospitals. And the data set that we will be working with is this chest uh, X-ray images data set that we found on Kaggle. So this is also publicly available for you to use as well. So that's on the setup of the demo. And now let's quickly have a look at the repository itself, because this is probably the interesting part where you can try out the demo yourself after this session. So what you can find in this medical imaging repo uh, is a separate folder called Federated Learning. And here you can find all the, the, the files that you need to get this demo up and running. So what we have here is a project.yaml file, and this is a specific configuration file related to NVIDIA Flare. So it contains some variables like a place where you can enter the, the server name, and this is basically used uh, for the clients in order to locate the specific server because the clients will be pulling for training instructions to the server. So that's why they need to know where the server is located. And we also have the configuration here for the three different hospitals. So the Europe hospital, the Asia hospital and the US hospital. And using the NVIDIA Flare library, we can run a provisioning command and use this project.yaml file to generate startup packages. And these startup packages can then be copied uh, both to the server as well to all the clients. I will show a bit more what that looks like later. Uh, and by running these startup packages, we can initiate the communication between all the parties that are involved in this federated learning setup. So we have the project.yaml file, and we also have two folders here that are different applications, uh, as we would call them, that can be used to create a training run. So we have, uh, we have one uh, overall training script that can train a PyTorch model based on the, the chest X-ray data set that I just showed. And it's focusing, focused on detecting pneumonia for these patients, for these X-rays that are found in the data set. 
And we have two different applications created based on that data set. One is a central version. So this can be used to do experiments just with one hospital to see what would the performance of the model be when we um, use the, the setup that we have, but then um, more similar to a classical machine learning approach. So we just have one client and the full data set so we can see what the accuracy would be. And we also have here the distributed setup. So that's in the pneumonia federated folder. And this can be used with multiple hospitals to actually train uh, a model using the federated learning approach. So what we have here is a custom folder. So we need our actual training code, of course. So that's what you will find here is a training script that might be quite familiar if you're familiar with uh, with computer vision and training uh, classification models specifically in PyTorch. We just need some specific uh, imports to make sure that we can use the NVIDIA Flare approach. So this is to make sure that we can share objects between the clients and the server, for example. But other than this, it's quite a uh, well, a, a, a training uh, script as you would probably recognize it as a data scientist. And we also use this data set to download the data sets to the uh, to the local clients to initiate the training. And what we also have in here is the configuration file. So these are more specific to NVIDIA Flare, but what we can define in here, for example, is how, what our uh, scatter and gather workflow looks like. What is the minimum amount of clients that we expect? How many rounds do we want to execute on? So a lot of the federated learning specific configuration can also be defined here. And maybe the last uh, thing that is interesting to show on this repo, because there's not just the, uh, the code for training uh, the model, but we also have some workflows in here that make it really easy to deploy this setup. And these workflows are implemented using GitHub Actions. And when you open this, you will actually see the instructions that you would need to, uh, to deploy this solution in your environment. So what you will see in the infra script uh, is that this script actually creates all the Azure resources that we need. Uh, so we start with a resource group as an input and based on that in this resource group, there will be a data science virtual machine that is deployed. We will open the specific networking ports that are needed uh, to initiate the communication between the clients and the server. And we also create uh, three different machine learning workspaces machine learning workspaces for the different clients. Uh, and we also have a, a fourth one, but I will I will show you later on that. So these are the workspaces that we need for the different clients and they all have a different location to make sure that it's an actual global setup. Then we also have a workflow here that is called data prep. And this is the workflow that we uh, use to split the data. So what we are doing here is based uh, on, the, on the Kaggle uh, Python API, we download the data set that we use and then we split it into three different parts and we split it randomly to make sure that we have three private data sets for the hospitals to work with. And then we also use uh, the, the same script here, so the same GitHub Actions workflow to make sure that we upload the private data sets to the different hospitals, the different clients that we are working with. So we have that all prepared before we start our training run. So after running both uh, GitHub Actions, which will not take you a lot of time, uh, the result will be that you have three different machine learning workspaces for the different clients where the data is already prepared. Uh, so what that will look like in the data section of your machine learning workspace, here I opened the local data sets, uh, and this is just a preview of what you will see. So this is just one of the images that we are working with, but we have actually all the files here uh, available to train our model with. So in this hospital has a local version of the data set, but also has the full version, just to make sure that we can also do that central experiment that I just talked about. So that's uh, that's a lot of the preparation that we need. But other than this, what I also did is create a compute instance in the different regions. I uploaded the, uh, the startup package that I created using the provisioning command from NVIDIA Flare. And then I initiated the communication between the clients and the server to make sure that we have that communication going on uh, ready to start with our experiments. So after doing all that setup, we have uh, here a machine learning workspace in Europe. We have an Asia hospital and we also have a US hospital all ready to, uh, to train our model. 
And now after doing this setup, let's go to the data scientist perspective. So this is more for the data scientist who wants to develop this training code that will be executed on the different clients. Uh, for that, we will open Visual Studio Code. And in this case, Visual Studio Code is actually, it's, it's running locally as you can see, but it's connected to my uh, virtual machine, to the data science virtual machine that I created for the federated server. And I cloned the repository here. Uh, I have the same file, so the, 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 the project.yaml, I have my training script here as well. So this is how I can develop my training code to make sure it can be improved or to change some of the parameters. Um, and this also downloads the data set to the local client. So this is the code that will be running on the local clients as soon as the experiment is kicked up, kicked off from a server perspective. So that's all we need right now we have our infrastructure we have our development environment where we have our training script developed now it's ready to start our federated learning experiment and for that i will uh, i will stay on my um, visual studio code here connected to the data science virtual machine and i opened a notebook and what is quite useful from the uh, nvidia flare library is that it also has a python interface that you can work with so that's quite familiar for most data scientists so for me it was also easy to work with in this case because uh, yeah I, I use python a lot so it's a bit easier than using a command line uh, from my perspective for example so what i did here is that i first connected to the admin client of um, of our setup so the admin client is similar to the federated server and is also running on the same virtual machine. And by connecting to the admin client, uh, it's basically a, a, an approach of starting our experiment. So we can use this to kick off our training run, for example. Uh, so here we are connecting to our admin client. And then the next step is to check the status of the server and the clients. So for that, we are using the same uh, admin client as we just connected to, but we are using a different command here that is called check status. We are checking the status of the server in this case, which will, <coughs> sorry, which will give us an object uh, that will say that currently the server is not running, uh, but that we do have three different clients that are connected to it and ready to start a training run. So here, as we were expecting, we see again the Asia hospital, the US hospital and the Europe hospital. Then now we have our clients connected. What we will do next is to submit our actual training job. So in this case, I will use the submit job command uh, and submit one of the applications that we have available in our repository. So the pneumonia federated was the distributed approach. So after submitting this job, it will actually start a training run on the three different clients that are connected. And we can also use the, uh, the Python package to check the status of that command. So we see here that it successfully submitted my job. And then the last step here on, uh, on, on the virtual machine is to list the different jobs here. So we also have a command for that. And based on that, we can check the status, which is quite useful because while you are developing, sometimes there's, uh, there's an error in your code or something goes wrong and you just want to validate how all your runs are doing. Uh, so it's quite useful that there's also a command for that. And now after this, we will switch back to Azure Machine Learning because we actually have another workspace that we are working with. Uh, and in this case, it's not for the clients, but it's a central workspace that is connected to this data science virtual machine. So while the, uh, the server is uh, running and receiving status updates from the different clients on how the training is going, there are actually metrics that can be collected. So even though the training data is not shared from a central perspective, we can still share some metrics like the accuracy on the validation data set, for example, um, to make sure that you can track the experiment as a central data scientist when you are developing your training code, for example. So this is why we are using this central workspace uh, and we are mainly using the jobs asset within this workspace. So here uh, there's actually an experiment called NVFlare experiment and uh, for every job that is uh, that is running there. Oh, sorry, for every uh, flare job that is running, there's also a machine learning um, a job created in a machine learning workspace. So you can actually track the different metrics here. 
so that's quite useful also for reference later on. And I want to highlight the results of some of the experiments that I did previously. So I have one which is the centralized training run. So in this case, uh, I only used one hospital to train the model with and also the full data set that can be found on Kaggle. And if we go to metrics here, then we see that in this case, it was only the Asia hospital that we trained on and that we were collecting the statistics on the training loss and the validation accuracy of this training run on this specific clients. And let's zoom out a little bit. Um, and what we can see here is that we can track the accuracy of the different runs that took place on this specific client and that overall we achieved a uh, validation accuracy of around 96%. So that's interesting for reference to compare with the distributed run that we were doing. So these are the results for the central experiment. And then we can go back here and select a distributed uh, or a decentralized run that we did. And in this case, if we go to the metrics, then we can see that we have the three different uh, hospitals uh, that all sent their metrics to the central workspace. So we have a lot more visuals here to, to check, uh, but this is useful because now we can compare actually the validation accuracy for this run, because in this case, the three different hospitals only had one third of the data set to work with, and there was no hospital who had all the data available as we had in the centralized experiment. And what you can see here is that we also achieved the validation accuracy for the hospitals of around 96, 97%. And that this is quite similar to the validation accuracy that we achieved for the centralized run. And this is an interesting insight that we see uh, popping up in more uh, similar experiments as well. So often it is possible to achieve a similar uh, performance when you do a federated learning run compared to a traditional machine learning training run. Uh, the difference is, is that it might take a bit longer uh, to achieve the same performance. So that's a bit of insight into, into those statistics. Um, something else I want to share here is a run that I did where we also stored the machine learning model. Uh, so in this case, we were using uh, the ML flow package to register the model after the training run. And when you go here to the run and to outputs, you will see that it automatically registered here the, the PyTorch model that we trained here. And it's actually not only the model itself, but also the Conda environment, for example. Uh, and this makes it quite easy to register your model and also use the machine learning workspace to create your deployment. So let me show you what it looks like. So imagine after your training run, you have registered the global model. So this is the model as a result of uh, aggregating the weights for the different local models that were trained. And then here in the output section, we have all the information from our model and we can click here on register. And it already recognizes that the type of the model is ML flow. And we can give it a name so we can say pneumonia model. And based on this, we can quite easily register it to the model registry of our workspace. I already did that before. So if we go to models here, then we see that we have a lot of different models here registered. Um, it takes some time to load. Yes, so here we see that, for example, we have our global model, which is also versioned. So there were six different versions of this model that I already registered, for example. So we can click on this model. And now what we can do is that we can also deploy our model into our workspace. So we can deploy it using a real time endpoint, which means that this model will now be available as a yeah, as a web service in a managed endpoint and we can actually use it to score some data. So if we have new images, then we can apply this model to that. So we can click on create a new deployment. We can give a new uh, endpoint name. So we say pneumonia endpoints. And now what is quite useful um, because we were using um, the ML flow uh, approach of registering the model that the scoring script and environment are automatically generated for you. So this is quite nice. Uh, it's actually also a similar feature to what the, the previous speaker also showed. 
Uh, but in this case, we're not using AutoML for images, but we uh, are using a, a custom approach for training the model using PyTorch. But still, because of ML, the ML flow way of registering the model, we can still leverage this functionality of using the scoring script and environment that are already created. So in this case, the only thing that we need to select is the compute size. And by yeah, just entering a couple of details, we can deploy this model into a managed endpoint. So that's quite useful, I would say. And that's it in terms of the demo. Uh, I now want to bring up a different slide again, um, just for some references. I'm not sure if there are any questions, but in case, um, in case you are interested to learn more about this, uh, what you can do is that you can go to our repository that I also showed. So in the medical imaging repository on Azure, you can find this folder called Federated Learning. Here you can find all the files that you need to deploy the solution yourself. We also have an in-depth blog post around this topic where you can find more of an overview, not only from a, a technical perspective, but also a bit more context and theory around how it works and how it is set up. And we have some information here on different federated learning Framework. So uh, we have NVIDIA Flare, but there are also some different approaches and frameworks that you could be looking at. Um, and lastly, we also have an episode of the AI show, which we recorded recently, where you can uh, also get some details around this approach of federated learning. Thank you very much, Harke and Andreas. Uh, that was really rich on information uh, and it was lovely to get some insights.